five ways that I see that GPS and load monitoring can be a really, really beneficial tool for you as a sports scientist and coaching staff. I made up some case studies for sports that I know are bigger in India, um, and I used a little bit of uh, help from uh, the internet and from reading some research to make sure that I understood the sports um, as best I could. But I'll let you guys read those on your own as kind of a starting point. But some first is just to understand the demands of the sport. And this is what we were doing with the soccer team. We knew the demands, but we wanted to understand what the demands were for our team, for our style of play, for our players. Okay, so quantifying the physical and mechanical demands of match play is the foundation, the absolute foundation, of evidence-based training design. It's the needs analysis, that's step number one that we learn uh, in the CSCS uh, prep, you know, under the NSCA or for the CPSS. It's one of the most foundational things that you can do. Um, with GPS, we can capture total and peak workloads, positional differences, movement patterns, etc. Some key metrics you might look for, total distance run, high speed running. Uh, you can set the threshold for that so that, uh, you know, if it's males or females or if it's, let's say, um, professional versus recreational, there's going to be different, um, different uh, thresholds for what counts as high speed running. Number of sprints, acceleration, deceleration load, player load, metabolic power. Those are some metrics you might look at and try to quantify and then it supports things like benchmarking okay what does what does the an elite game require or what do our starters require what does our, what do our seniors do that our freshmen don't do um, specificity okay what are training drills replicating competition intensities if your drills are here and you see that the game demands are here well then you better bring those drills up right in order to prepare the athletes Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes game demands are here and you have a coach who just runs them into the ground. And so then we need to say, hey coach, let's, you know, let's scale it back a little bit because they have to be prepared for the game. There might be a time for this, but probably not within the same microcycle as an important match. All right, um, tons of research around this. Um, uh, quantifying match demand. Some of the first uh, uh, research published in any sport using load monitoring is going to be just to quantify the demands of, the, of that sport. The next thing that we can do is adapting our periodization on the fly. And I don't mean on the fly as an unplanned, I mean in response to the actual training. Okay, we the load data directly informs the microcycle and the mesocycle planning. Uh, think back to general adaptation syndrome, uh, stimulus recovery adaptation, fitness fatigue paradigm, um, all of those things um, on a grand scale and conceptually. Now we can be more agile because we can actually monitor the, the dose response relationship in our athletes. Uh, we have both acute and cumulative load that we are looking at. Remember acute to chronic workload ratios that we're looking at. This could be volume and intensity distribution across weeks, high days versus low days, and actually quantifying is that high day actually in high, a high day? Is the low day actually a low day? Tapering strategies like deloads, super compensation timing, drill sequencing. So which drills that we have our athletes do give them more high speed running exposures versus less. And high speed running exposures should be spaced apart because you know if we're going to sprint them and hit max velocity, we probably shouldn't hit max velocity the very next day or multiple days in a row. So making sure that there's sufficient recovery but also sufficient density because well, the most of the hamstring research is showing that sprinting is not only the cause of most hamstring injuries, it's also the best way to mitigate hamstring injuries if you have uh, frequent enough sprinting twice a week, maybe uh, you know a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on the type of athlete and the other types of training modalities that they're doing. All right, key tools here, acute to chronic workload ratio, rolling load models, meaning like a continuous rolling average, um, cumulative high-speed running or impulse loads are very important. Okay, so example, post uh, post-match fatigue is highest at 24 to 48 hours so loading players at that time may delay neuromuscular recovery so it just helps in this case is helping to influence our recovery strategies and I have for you um, a youth soccer uh, sort of case study that you guys can go through on your own as well just with you know some kind of very generalized um, examples here and some solutions that you could do if you were facing a problem like this all right, use case number three out of five is managing specific high speed actions. Okay, high speed locomotor actions are both performance defining, um, but they're also, they also increase our risk of injury. Okay, especially as I've said before in the hamstring and the groin regions. High speed running is often 
underrepresented in training. How often as a strength and conditioning staff or even sometimes as a coaching staff are we putting our athletes in position to be able to hit high speeds? Sometimes the, the sport and the positions themselves don't lend themselves to hitting high speed. And so you might think, well, if they don't do it often in sport, why should we do it in practice? And the reason is because they might do it in sport. And that one time they do it in sport, in the game, that one time they get a breakaway, that one time they have to go end zone to end zone or goal to goal, um, and they actually hit top speed, might be the time that they pull their hamstring. So they have to be ready for that. Um, Oh, there, there, I've said it right there. Athletes may only hit top speed once or twice in a game or many times, um, but injury risk increases without regular submaximal exposure and um, occasional max exposure, as I've said as well. So some things we might look at. Um, exposure tracking. So looking at uh, meters over 19.8 uh, kilometers per hour, looking at sprint counts, um, looking at uh, high-speed running targets, uh, compensatory high-intensity interval training. Uh, we'll look at that here in a minute. Positional constraints, fly-in sprints, those could all be very important things to, to start tracking. Change of direction quantification. So because Catapult has a, an IMU as well as a GPS in each of the pods that the players wear, well, we can also look at what types of change of direction are they making? Is it mostly curvilinear? Is it mostly 90 degrees? Is it a mixture of everything? And we can start to quantify the change of direction demands of the sport. Okay, so really we want to maintain a consistent high speed running exposure without getting an acute spike. Okay, more of a drip feed rather than a flood all at once. And we have a cricket. I had a lot of fun learning about the different types of cricket, by the way. It's a fascinating sport. I used to think cricket was like baseball with a with a flat bat and maybe some of you are hearing that and you're getting oh no it's so different and so uh, I, I'll tell you it was it was fascinating learning about the different types and I had no idea I knew cricket could be a long game but I I was reading that some games last a whole day sometimes more than a whole day like that's wild um, and I'd love to learn more sometime but anyways I have a bit of a case study here hopefully it's mostly accurate um, about cricket that you can look through as far as high speed running goes Okay, and then number four um, is compensatory training. I mentioned that on the last one. Compensatory training for non-starters and return to play. Super important, okay? This is really managing the acute to chronic workload ratio and the number of exposures of high-speed running to make sure they have consistent stimuli um, if they're not playing in, this, in the game, okay? So athletes who don't uh, participate fully in the matches or who are returning to play may not be getting the same stimulus and in fact are not getting the same training stimulus as the athletes who play full minutes or who play every game. So we want to use load monitoring to, to detect those discrepancies in weekly high-speed running volumes or accelerometry so that then in our training we can dose them appropriately. So for example, maybe a, a soccer midfielder is on the bench for that game um, and they only play a little bit, they only accumulate 200 meters of high-speed running in a week which is way below what they need to sustain um, their ability to do that in a match. Okay, so the solution is we would know that because we're tracking them using GPS and then we have an individualized high intensity interval training session to help that athlete stay in top shape so that when they are called upon, maybe there's a substitution or an injury um, on the field and they have to be called in suddenly and now suddenly they have to do a thousand meters of high speed running, they're prepared for it, okay? So uh, this ensures load continuity. Um, readiness does not always equal availability unless load is matched, okay? So very important there. And um, again, Kabaddi, very fascinating. Um, I didn't learn as much about Kabaddi as about cricket, but um, it seems like every country has their own sort of uh, version or, or tweak on, on rugby or football or some sort of contact sport like that. Um, so you guys can read through that on your own as well, sort of the problem and solution that you could do with compensatory loading. I know our rugby team here in town in San Diego, the San Diego Legion, uh, they, they have a model of this where they're guys who don't play as much in the game, you know, after the session, it's not a punishment or anything, it's just, hey, we're gonna get our fitness in um, and they're gonna do this compensatory load matching. And then lastly, um, last use case is monitoring individual uh, load response profiles because we know that not every athlete responds the same way. And this is kind of, you know, kind of like what I said at the beginning where sport and sports science and coaching, it's about winning and losing, yes. 
Um, it's, a, it's because we love sport, yes, but more so it's because we really want to serve the athlete and the team um, in front of us. And so we know that a team is made of individuals and those individuals matter. And so if you have one, an entire team that's adapting very well, but you have one athlete who's adapting a little bit differently, we can tell that with, uh, by monitoring individual load responses. And so we, we should very much adjust training for that athlete or come in and support with other recovery modalities or at the very least have a conversation about maybe some outside stressors that could be impacting their training, okay? Um, so we could look at, uh, we could start to profile internal versus external load relationships in individual athletes. Is athlete A always producing a higher heart rate for the same drill than athlete B? Or even, is athlete A producing a higher heart rate for that drill than they have in the past? Um, is athlete B's RPE consistently elevated despite low external metrics? That's a red flag for us. We can start to detect early the signs of accumulated fatigue, non-functional overreaching, um, and this enables flagging of red zone athletes to support athlete to coach conversations. Okay, It's all about the relationship still. As um, Krinish was saying so eloquently at the beginning of the session here, um, it's really about enabling those conversations between the athlete and coach or between the performance staff and the athlete um, in order to make sure we're taking the best care of our athletes as we can. Okay, and then we, and then I, uh, uh, Dr. Aperva told me that badminton is really uh, big in your country, so uh, I included a badminton um, case study as well. I played badminton one time in the last, I mean, I played it as a kid in PE, physical education, and then we had a, um, we had a badminton tournament at, at our department, and I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. Like, nobody is good at badminton here, and so my colleague and I were going to be partners, we're gonna like have we're gonna wear our mustaches, you know. So we like grew out our beards and then shaved it off. Just had mustaches for the game. Like we had cut off sleeves and we're like, yes, we're gonna crush our students in badminton. And I didn't end up winning a single match, you guys. I was and I was super sore at the end. So it, it was more embarrassing than anything. Um, and maybe it's because I, you know, I didn't do any of this load response or actually any training in badminton before we actually um, competed. Um, so. With all of that, sort of in summary, the good news is that really when you think about it, when you think about training, if you understand the training process, then the good news is that sports science is really simple. It's just tracking that training. All you're doing is tracking it and looking for trends. It boils down to that. Um, the bad news is that as we saw in, in, with all the slides of the different metrics you can look at, the amount of time it's going to take to process the data, the different types of testing you have going on, being at every single session, um, uh, you know, the bad news is that it's hard. Okay? It's simple, but it's hard. And it's hard because underneath the simplicity is infinite complexity that you could really dive into. But my encouragement to you would be to start with what's simple. Start with what might seem obvious because what's obvious to you is maybe not obvious to everyone else. And what's obvious to you may only, without monitoring, without quantification, it might just be your intuition, right? Because you know the game, because you have a good coach's eye, because the art of coaching is strong. But to quantify it, now it makes it fact. Does that make sense? So you could see something, you could perceive something, but when you quantify it, it's a fact. And then you can make better decisions based off that set of facts and either confirm your intuitions or falsify those in intuitions. And really that's what we're trying to do with science. We're trying to either validate or invalidate our prior hypothesis. And that's what makes for a good sports scientist. Um, and so if you wanted to check out any of the references I used for the talk today, they're listed here. And thank you. This is a, a little video of uh, some of what we've gotten to do with our soccer team just very briefly. So thank you guys very much. Um, thank you all for being here today. I really, uh, you know, I'm honored to give this talk. And if we, if you do have any time, I am open to take some questions. <laughs>